Hello and welcome to Africa Today. I am Mike Okoche. The fifth election in South Africa's 20 years of democracy is now history with the African National Congress recording another victory and preserving the winning streak that began with Nelson Mandela in 1994. But this time, the ANC under Jacob Zuma's dwindling popularity lost 15 seats in parliament as he shared nearly 6% of the vote as he had in the 2009 elections. Now, many attribute this trend to the fact that Zuma's tenure as head of state in the last four years holds a record of corruption allegations and failed economic policies. Meanwhile, strike in South Africa's platinum sector has gone on for a record-breaking 16 weeks, making it the longest and costliest strike in the nation's history. What are your expectations from Jacob Zuma ahead of his second term in office? You can talk to us on Twitter at TVC Africa Today or send an email to Africa Today at tvcnews.tv. We'll take this report on the political mood that trailed the outcome of the elections in the Rainbow Nation and Africa Today. We'll be right back. Thanks for joining us. The Democratic Alliance tends Supporters of the African National Congress glued to big screens as IEC Chief Pansi Takula read through the provincial and eventually the national results of the 2014 general elections, earning their run. It's been a very long four years of waiting. We've had a lot of issues within the ANC, so I'm quite excited that um, we finally made it. So I'm very excited. The ANC is rooted amongst the people. Uh, particularly where the poor and the, and the uh, oppressed people are. Um, the ANC has shown again that notwithstanding um, its own challenges, um, it can certainly uh, bring the people of this country together. I'm so happy about the victory that we, we've achieved as the African National Congress. To, even though we had challenges before these elections, but we worked very hard to make sure that we we go to all areas of the country to make sure that we we mobilize our supporters. Zuma said ANC is going to rule until Jesus Christ comes. And he will. So I'm happy. So it shows what our forefathers, what they fought for, is back now again, again. And our president needs to get another chance so he can leave his mark now. reactions from the elections. Now recently I was away in South Africa during the national elections and for the few days I spent monitoring and reporting from the Rainbow Nation. It was a great experience but today on the show we'll be looking at latest developments with respect to the economic issues and labor disputes in South Africa. But first let's begin the show with a clip of the interview I had with Moeletsi Mbeki, the deputy chairman of the South African Institute for International Affairs He's also the brother of former President Thabo Mbeki. Well, you know, 20 years of democracy or 20 years of independence in Africa, in all African countries, has been a very critical moment because people at independence have very high expectations and their political leaders promise them the earth uh, they promise big change which is necessary you know it's the end of colonialism the Africans are ruling themselves they are running their own show so they have a right to have high, expe high expectation and the leaders are right to promise them that the world is going to be changed their, their life is going to be changed they are no longer going to be ruled by foreigners. They will be ruled by their own people. So 20 years later, the people want to know, OK, we had these big promises. What have they added up to? So that, I think, is what is important about the South African election. It really follows the path of many other African countries. <music> big problem of governance in Africa is we are still running with these semi-colonial or neo-colonial political systems where the political elite are really not accountable to, to the population. They are more accountable to the World Bank and the IMF and to the multinationals than they are to the African people. 
And this is the problem of governance in Africa. So what we need to do, obviously, is to raise the power of the population. But to raise the power of the people, you have to increase their economic standing, their standards of living, because that's what gives you power. You have to increase their education levels, not just a few individuals, but a mass education levels, because that's what gives you power. That's what gives the people power. Then the issue of governance will start to be resolved. Well, the, the problem with capitalism in Africa is that it's not our own system. Capitalism in Europe, in North America, in Japan, is their own system. The capitalist system in Africa is not our system. We inherited it from the colonialists. But the colonialists had created a capitalist system that disadvantaged the mass of the people. And because it disadvantaged the mass of the people, the people reject the system. I mean, if you look at South Africa, to give you an example, many people think that South Africa is capitalist and the, capi and the people in South Africa accept the capitalist system. We have a strike going on in South African mines, which is now running for three months. And this is an expression of the people rejecting the capitalist system because in this country we have a migrant labor system which hugely disadvantages African households at the expense of mining companies. So that's why the, we need to create our, if that's what we want, we have to build our own capitalist system that handles the issues of our cultural issues, our cultural concern. If you visit a country like Japan, for example, Japan is a capitalist country, but it's very different from the United States or the United Kingdom. It's their own system they build themselves. Well, I agree that we shouldn't. However, we have to respect the constitutions of other countries. In my own country, South Africa, we have a limitation of two terms, two five-year terms. That is constitutional. They, in Zimbabwe, they had a Westminster system. They've modified it now, but they had a Westminster system. And under the Westminster system, there are no term limitations. Uh, so there, there were, in fact, no limitations on terms uh, that a, a president can serve in Zimbabwe. So we have to be cautious about, uh, about that point of view. The British themselves have no limitations on the terms. I think Margaret Thatcher served, served two and a half terms until her own party got fed up with the parliamentary system. <laughs> yes, under <laughs> their parliamentary <laughs> system, until her party got fed up of her and, and kicked her out. But she was entitled to serve. Uh, it was the same with Tony Blair. Again, the party decided enough of this guy. So, so it depends really on the constitution of the country in question. Well, personally, I was one of the people who warned Mo Ibrahim about his project. Uh, I have a lot of respect for Mo. He's a great African entrepreneur. He has achieved a lot. However, you don't build democracy by rewarding the leaders. You build democracy by facilitating power in the grassroots, in, in helping the grassroots be, to become more powerful so they can stand up to the elite and stand up to the people in control. So that was my, my suggestion to him. But one would, but one would think that uh, <clears throat> setting up an award like that will motivate the leaders to do right things for Africans generally. Yeah, well, well, I don't think so. <laughs> because first, these guys are very well paid when they are presidents. So promising them a nice pe pension when they can write their own pension check when they are still leaders is not much of an incentive to them. So you reward people instead of more using his money to reward leaders who are anyway there to serve the people they promised to serve. In my view, I think he should be using his funds to help to strengthen grassroots organizations that make the presidents accountable. Mm -hmm. 
my message to them is that they have to be prepared to make the major sacrifice to achieve this African common market. How was the European Union created? The two biggest countries in Europe were prepared to make the sacrifices, which was Germany and France. They said, we will make the sacrifice, so we will open our markets, we will do so that the smaller countries can feel that they can benefit from this. The problem we have in Africa is our big countries are not prepared to make the sacrifice. And that is where our stumbling block is sitting. And that was Moaleti Mbeki in a recent interview I had with him in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, a walkout by thousands of miners in the Rainbow Nation led by the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union has halted about 40% of the world's production of the precious metal. I will go on a quick break and when we return, the South African miners' strike will be our focus. Sit with us. Right, if you're joining us, this is Africa Today, and on this segment we'll be looking at the miners' strike in South Africa, and we have Uche Eke, a lawyer and a consumer rights activist with us in the studio. You're welcome to Africa Thank Today. Thank you very much. You're it's welcome. a pleasure to have me there. All right. Yeah. And when, as we progress, we'll be linking up on phone with Jacques Botha, an economist based in South Africa. Now, let's, let's start this way. What's your assessment on the lingering industrial action in the mining sector in South Africa? It's, it's been well, on for uh, a long time. If you recall very well, uh, South, Africa, South Africa has had a very, very checkered history in terms of, uh, you know, uh, minus strike. Mm. But I think what marks out this one is that this one has a, a record-breaking one <laughs> because it has been the, it's longest, been the longest, re exactly. longest mm. and uh, the costliest in terms of loss to the mm. economy. So I, I, I think uh, it's part of a, a system where you know, the labor issues are being, you know, seriously taken care of, unlike mm. Nigeria here, where we, you know, take things, you know, like drastically. So I, I, I think what over 70,000 members of, uh, you know, Association of, uh, you know, South Africa Miners' Mine Worker Construction Union are doing, they are mainly exercising in line with, you know, provisions of the International Labor Organization, provisions that, you know, enjoins workers to demand and agitate for, you know, you know higher pays and wages, which mm. is the bone of contention. And that issue must be addressed. Well, the, the, the employers are saying the demand for $1,200 right. is really way outrageous. But what's, what's your assessment? On well, that? you can't not rule it out. Just like in comparison, now we know like oil is mm. the mainstay of the Nigerian economy. Mm. And we all know people who are in the oil industry, gas, what they earn here. Likewise in South Africa, that is the mainstay of the economy. And that is what holds the economy. So if the people should come out, they know how much they make. Because he who pays the piper should dictate it to these people. Have been, and don't forget, this is not the first time this agitation is coming up. It has come sometime the latest in 2012. We're about 34, you know, miners were shot dead by the police because of the violence that attended it. So I think it is something that really should come for collective bargaining. Let all the parties be involved rather than, you know, from because what we are seeing now is like uh, they are trying to... The, you know, the, the mining companies are now trying to use divide and rule by using, you know, the rifle union, you know, because we understand that it's a rifle union that, that seems to, you know, working at, you know, cross purpose is what, you know, the main, you know, uh, miners union is doing. Mm. So that is not what you, we should be doing now, because yeah. if you look at the economy, from what they're saying, it's already having a very big toll on the economy of South Africa. So I think what they should do is to sit down together, have what we call collective bargaining okay so that there's even if they don't meet you know the, you know that uh, you know ceiling that these people are demanding but there shall be a meeting that should not be a meeting point in the demand it's all right you know in all of this mix as the case may be where does the law come in in resolving this kind of dispute well as i said uh, the law that governs there is what we call international labor organization laws mm. and most countries of the world are signatories they have conventions and treaties than tend to bind, you know, the condition of workers, mm. you know, terms and, you know, the way strikes are carried out. 
Uh, but they are quite different. I oppose from municipal law, which we, you know, or, you know uh, okay. things that are okay. obtainable in, you know, in individual countries like Nigeria and South Africa. Mm. So if it's a South African law, if it is more than a long, you know, the International Labour Organization Convention, what they should do is to come, what we call, set up a committee that will consist of, you know, the employers and employees, and then employ a kind of a mediator that should come and mediate on this issue so that at the end there will be what we call collective bargaining so that it will neither be that the worker the employers or the employees anyone should be it should not be a win-win you know situation mm. so that is exactly what we should be expecting now because what we are saying and if you check from what we have seen the employers are merely you know uh, saying that they will pay only is it a, a double by 10 percent mm -hmm. which is to these people, they say no. <laughs> it's, it's because nothing of the, to them. Nothing to them. <laughs> because of the, you know, you know the, the, the tedious nature and sensitive mm. nature of the job they're doing that. And most of them, that is not enough to meet their standard of living. Okay. And look at them, because of this, there's a lot of migration from what you have heard from, my, you know, this, the town in the Maka or something. Uh, most of them have migrated from that town now back to the rural areas where they come from. So you could see the cumulative effects that they have on the South African economy. It's okay. We'll, we'll come back to this. Yes, now, sir. joining us on phone is uh, Jacques Botha, an economist in South Africa. Jacques, it's good to have you on Africa Today. Now, the latest platinum miners' strike has been deemed the longest industrial action in South Africa's history. Why is it taking so long to resolve? Hello. I'm sorry, you, it's quite, the signal is very bad, but I, I believe you said, you, you, I hear that you say it's the longest strike and why, why, is, why things are not lingering on, why is it not being re, 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 settled? Is that what you are? Exactly. I'm asking, why is it taking so long to resolve? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a very, uh, it's, it's a very sad situation. I, I don't know if you recall, about two months ago, I already warned and I thought that, 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 that there was too strong positioning uh, where both sides of this battle just dug in their hip. It was like it was almost a lose-lose battle. It's all or nothing. AMCU thought they had the power and they just wanted what they wanted and they dug in the hills. I mean, the demands were maybe a bit, it, it is a bit high. Uh, it's an incredible jump and it would definitely make uh, the mining houses uh, run in a loss if those wage increases were given through immediately. On the other hand, the, for the first time after the, the, the democracy of South Africa, there has been a very good uh, co coordination and working together of government, the business, and the big powerful uh, Kusat to trade union, which is NUM, and NUM is the, mine, the miners' official union. They were all against UNCU. The, the, the NUM people, of course, because that's now an opposition union, and the mind, the, the business, of course, business always wants to get get the get the, the best uh, with the least amount of expenses. And government also uh, wanted to rather protect their friends, uh, NUM, the other the, the rival union who lost a lot of ground against AMCU. So for the first time, everybody had a common enemy, enemy common uh, AMCU. So business, uh, government, and the trade unions were stood together. And they felt that they had a very strong, totally they thought they could just win this easily. Uh, and everybody was thinking that the government would really want this not to, this un unsettled situation not linger over the elections. We have had our general elections last week with little violence, so that's gone. And actually AMCO has a slightly weaker negotiation uh, process now. But in the meanwhile, <clears throat> another sort of offshoot party from the ANC, the ruling party, is the Economic Freedom Front, mm. uh, Julius Malema, who is really, really not very, who do, really doesn't show his disdain and disrespect for the current leader, Jacob Zuma, like many other people do, actually. Mm. So the unpopular Jacob Zuma, amongst many people, is now public enemy number one for, ja for Julius Malema. And he's now got quite a, he actually got quite a, he got sort of, uh, uh, I think his percentage vote was almost four uh, percent. All right, Jackie. Uh, from a nothing. So that. All right, Jackie. Let, let me ask you this, uh, Jackie. Let me let me ask you this. How much of impact is this having on the South African economy right now? Uh, not visibly. That's the thing. Okay. Not visibly. But can I just sort of finish? So the problem is so so. Julius, the, the, the economic freedom front is now on Mku's side. So we have again the stalemate where the two parties are just 
any sort of, they both just want the, the they want to win. It's impacting on the South African economy from a, it's, it's the, the region, the Rustenburg region is not doing well. Uh, we're not exporting, there's a, that platinum was one of our biggest um, commodity exporters, so we're losing that. So we're losing the, the exports, that's not very good for the economy, and also all the jobs. The whole region, the whole economy is actually uh, paralyzed. <clears throat> So that has a, has a significant impact on the economy. Uh, then, of course, the confidence, the, the investment, investment confidence in South Africa is also uh, uh, sort of not so good. Uh, the similar situation like you've had with your Boko Haram uh, problems in the north. So there, you know, people are now cautious to invest in South, more cautious to invest in South Africa, and our currency is also under pressure because of that. All right, thank you, Jack. He's bothered for... Say, Thank you, Jacky. Sorry, that's the much time can permit us now. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let me ask. Is it justiciable to the level where if a case like this is taken to court, the court can say, workers, we want you to go back to, the, to work now, or employers, you have to pay this amount now, and we give you between this time and this time to resume. Is it, is it clear cut like that? Under our jurisdiction here in Nigeria, as I said, you know, each country operates its own you know, mm. labor laws. Labor laws, different. So in Nigeria, such a thing, if it has happened, what you have given, you have to give a notice of such intention to go on strike. Mm. And after that, uh, the labor minister will set up a committee that will made up of negotiate what we call negotiators or mediators that will come and see how that matters could be uh, resolved mm. within some days. And where such matters are not unable to be resolved, then the best option is to have a recourse to court, which, of course, in our jurisdiction, the National Industrial Court. Okay. But from what we are seeing from South Africa, rather than doing that, you could see some, you know, element of uh, blackmail being employed by, you know, the mining company. That from what we hear, some of that, rather than coming, meeting, and discussing with, they are sending, you know, text messages to some of the members asking them to resume and then giving them some secret incentives. Rather than calling all of them, so it's uh, like a divide and rule. A divide and rule, and yeah. there is no way to work. So I think the best thing and the best reason. Is for them to recourse to legal process, which I think is the only way out of this deadlock. But it's so much doing, you know, so you know, such adver adversarial position. Both parties adversary. It won't go anywhere. Anyway. Right. The only way is to recourse to their legal system. All right. Now, in in this in this kind of a deadlock, as the case, if we have to call it that way, so at that what is. point can the government wade in? to well, try to resolve it the should issue. be. They both have a minister that is in charge of labor matters. At this stage, he ought to have, let, you know, waded into this matter. Because for whatever, this has lasted for over 16 weeks. I don't know why the Nigeria such thing should have happened. What is should be, the minister in charge of labor should have, you know, set up a committee of negotiators and mediators that will now call both parties to other, and they'll enter, just like it has happened in Nigeria during ASO, ASO strike, but you know what happened? The federal government set up several committees and mediators that mediated. That is what we should be expecting from the South African authorities. Mm -hmm. And maybe because of the election, they're just coming out from the election and campaigning period. Maybe what we'll expect in no distant time, that should be done. That's the only way out of the present quagmire they're you know, passing through. All right. B before we go, let me ask this. The point there is industrial action has been very common in the major countries in Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, That's and right. so on. Why are this recurring it, it because, in It is because with this part of our developing country, most parameters that make up for, you know, the cost of living, the standard of living of workers are not taken into consideration mm. in fixing wages. That is why you could see a minor, maybe you don't take into consideration the cost of housing, the cost of education, health care. You just see that's the that, like example what is happening in Nigeria today. We say the minimum wage mm. is 18,000 Naira. These are things that, you know, that they have, you know, scientific, you know, data and indices of fixing, whatever, you know, wages for workers. And that's why you see it ha hardly, such incident hardly happens in advanced countries. But in developing countries, these are things where things are just half, half hazardly done without taking into, you know, cognizance some of these, you know, parameters we are saying, like the cost of education, the cost of housing. Then other things that, you know, concern the basic needs of mm. workers, they are not taken into consideration. Now, when you talk about, you talked about minimum wage, exactly. Yes. That, that's, that's one yeah. issue that has been very common amongst African countries. But, but if it is left in the hands of demand yeah. and supply, for instance, that's or the right. forces of demand, that's do you right. think it's going to be fair on the employer? Well, on the employee, rather. On the employee. Mm. 
I think uh, well, if left to the forces of supply and demand, what should be done is just to make straight into, like in Nigeria, there is a commission that is called Utilities and Charges Commission. Mm. It should be their duty to take into consideration all these, you know, uh, indices that I've just mentioned. They should be taken into, not leaving everything, it's not about Naira and Kobo. That is not governance. You have to take all these issues, Utilities and Charges Commission, before you increase or before there's agitation for any increment. There must be salaries and wages commission. They must all, all meet, gather, take into consideration what are the costs of transportation, where are we, what, are, what are the things that affect the welfare of, uh, of workers. These are things that ought to be taken, not leaving everything to the forces of supply and demand. That will not really you know, solve the problem as it were. Okay, we'll take it. Thank you very thank much for coming. It's a pleasure. Today. Thank you thank very you. much, Mike. Uh, we also thank uh, Jackie's Botter for joining us online from South Africa earlier on, and we had an interview with Moeleti Mbeki earlier on too. It is a mix of two contrasting situations in South Africa where mine workers on strike are not relenting on their demand for a basic monthly wage of about $1,200 at a time when the ruling party is still basking in the euphoria of election victory. And this is also happening at a time when there is growing inequality, poverty and unemployment in one of Africa's biggest economy. The miners in South Africa only hope and pray that their living condition will improve anytime soon. That's our show for today. You can watch episodes of the show on youtube.com forward slash TVC Africa today. And until we come your way again, I am Mike Okoche. And remember, this is Africa. Bye for now.